Good evening, virtual visitors. My name is Shakia Gillette. I am the director of the African American History Initiative here at the Missouri Historical Society. Welcome to our program and thank you for joining us tonight. Before we get started, we would like to thank our members, donors, and supporters from the Zoo Museum Tax District. As a part of our long tradition of working actively toward racial equity and our commitment to improving and diversifying the historical perspective, we are proud to present to you the third keynote presentation of our How Did We Get Here? Conversations about race, anti-Blackness, and identity series. Many people have referred to the current climate as the summer of awakening. And in many ways, this entire series is designed to awaken and provoke you to see history in a different light. As the Missouri Historical Society, it is our job to provide historical perspective on timely issues and cross historic, economic, and racial divides in order to tell the story of everyone who calls the St. Louis region home. I want to first applaud each of you for participating in this discussion. Tonight's presentation may feel uncomfortable at times, but it is important to create a space where dialogue and deep discussion may happen. We acknowledge that each of you have different vantage points and based on your lived experience, but please utilize this time to listen to different perspectives and gain knowledge. It is our job to bring provocative voices to the forefront. And in addition to focusing on national events, we want to be sure to highlight various aspects of local history. For this specific program, our original intent was to make a direct connection to the uprisings that are taking place in Minneapolis, Minnesota, as a result of the murder of George Floyd. Immediately following his murder, the target in the, Min the Minnesota mixed neighborhood, excuse me, became the topic of discussion on all of the news outlets, and we couldn't help but draw parallels to our local target in, Brent, in the Brentwood Promenade and how this once prosperous Black neighborhood was destroyed as a means to continue divestiture in Black neighborhoods. Tonight's presentation will highlight various disappearing or destroyed Black neighborhoods in this region. The program will run for about 90 minutes, which includes a presentation, a brief moderated discussion, and a 10-minute Q&A. For your convenience, you can submit questions through the Q&A button on your toolbar. And in order to streamline the process, we would prefer if you wait until the end to ask your question. Please know we'll do our very best to get to all of your questions, but we may not have time to get to everyone's question. We are honored to host this program and grateful to Dr. John Wright for sharing his expertise with our guests this evening. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Ms. Gwen Moore. Ms. Moore serves as the Curator of Urban Landscapes and Community Identity here at the M Missouri Historical Society. Gwen will jumpstart the conversation and tell us a bit more about our featured guests. Thank you, Gwen, so much for joining us this evening. And I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Shakia. And uh, I'm really privileged to be able to introduce Dr. John Light, who is the leading scholar on African, of the African-American experience here in St. Louis. As you can probably imagine, Dr. Uh, Wright has a very long resume, uh, one that I could not really do justice to in a short period of time. So it's gonna be abbreviated. But I always like to say, John Wright really needs no introduction because if you know anything about St. Louis, you know John Wright. But I'm gonna give you a little background information on Dr. Wright. First of all, Dr. Wright is a native St. Louisan, uh, born and reared here, educated in the St. Louis Public Schools, got his BA from Harris Teachers College, the present day Harris Stowe Tate State University, got his master's and his PhD from St. Louis University. He went on to have a stellar career in academics and as an educational leader. He was the uh, interim superintendent of the St. Louis Public Schools here in St. Louis. Uh, served the same role as with the Normandy public school system and was the assistant superintendent of the Ferguson Larson School District. So in, in addition to this career as, a, as an educator and an educator, educating uh, administrator, he's also a scholar and he has probably done more work 
on um, uh, researching the African American experience in St. Louis than any other scholar that I know. Uh, he is the leading scholar. He is the leading expert. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, drawing from a book that he wrote called St. Louis, Disappearing Black Communities, uh, which should be in everybody's library. Uh, all 13 of his books should be in everybody's library. But I'm going to mention one in particular, which is a foundational reference work on African Americans here in St. Louis, and that's Discovering African American St. Louis. Uh, mine is dog eared. I've used it so much in my work. And I'm looking forward to anything that Dr. Reich uh, puts pen and uh, ink to, to paper. And I'm also really anxious to hear his presentation uh, this evening, particularly since um, my family was from one of those disappearing Black communities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wright. Well, I hope I don't miss your family this evening. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many communities uh, that have disappeared. And we have so many out there. I'm just sorry we don't have time to expose, ex expose ourselves to all of them. This is the First Baptist Church of Baldwin which came in in the 1800s, early 1800s. It's, by many it's considered, I think 1835, the judge when Ball was out of the hitherlands gave them permission to build a church. You have to remember, many of our early black communities were outside of St. Louis and they didn't have the restrictions that we had in the city of St. Louis. So a judge gave the community the right to build a church. So this is uh, their first church here. It was on Long, Long Road. Now you have to remember, it was a time when whites weren't interested too much in having blacks in the community of having close to being close to them. Now let's take the next slide. Next. Now they bought them out and they built this church. You see, you make money sometimes when they want you out of the neighborhood. And uh, then they were bought out again. Now they stayed uh, Baldwin with this church. They even have a cemetery out there. Now let's see the next slide. Now they built another church in Blackjack because they built a church where the African-American community was now beginning to live. And so each time, I wish we could, couldn't get a picture of the front of the church. This is the back of it. This is the one you see when you're driving around and it says Baldwin First Baptist Church. But as black communities move, we get, the church has a chance to grow. But they leave their original site, original site, because they're pushed out. Okay, next slide here. Now this is Music Baptist Church. Started around 1811. Now what happened, Eddie Music, a slave owner, heard the music coming from the uh, African Americans, was so thrilled and elated to see such joy from the Africans, that he let them build a church. In honor of him, they named the church after him, Music Baptist Church. Now, the church is still there along with the cemetery, which we're going to see next. All the homes in the neighborhood are gone. Industry has taken them out. But the church has maintained its roots there. You notice it was started by early Africans. This was started by a slave owner who gave the permission. And here we are now, 2020, and the church is still there. Although the community is gone, the church is still there. Let's look, here's a cemetery here. Next, we can see that. That's the cemetery. Now, many of our early black cemeteries the people have moved away, and so they've been overgrown and taken over by weeds, but they maintain this cemetery and church here. It's right near uh, Westport Plaza. 
if you're out that way. You can see it. Next, please. Now, Chesterfield First Baptist Church of Chesterfield. This is another church that was on the road, uh, busy thoroughfare, and all of a sudden industry wanted to add that. And so they had them to move. And let's look at the next slide here. They built this church. And the community wanted them to move again. And so you pay a price when you move folks out. You really want them out. Next slide. This is them today. So a lot of people who moved out, to African Americans who moved west in the Chesterfield area, they attend the church. It's a lovely church. I've been there for a funeral service and was very pleased to go there. It's, it's an attractive building, attractive facility, but they've grown from that little frame building on the road that was bought out for industry. They've moved into a very nice church off of Wild Horse Creek Road in um, Chesterfield. So it, it just goes to show you what's happened. Many people don't know the story of Panda Church and how it's grown over the years. Let's take the next one. Now, Bridgeton Baptist is built on a land given by black residents of the area by an abolitionist. They say he was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And so he wanted them to have this church. And so the highway took out the black community, part of the black community in Bridgeton. Highway 70 went down, took out the school, the house. I met one lady who used to go to the African school there. And she said the highway took them out. And if you go out to Bridgeton and look at Highway 70, that's where the church used to be right there in Bridgeton. Now let's go to the next slide. When they bought them out, they moved to Robertson and they gave them enough money to build this church. Now, I don't know if you know what happened to Robertson. Robertson was bought out and Bridgeton Baptist had built another church further out, which I didn't get a chance to get a good picture of. And it's a larger, more guess uh, fashion modern church that's built in blackjack because our African community has moved to blackjack because now Robertson is under the runway of the airport so as we can see racism uh, has taken a lot of our black churches out uh, because we live in areas that are easy to buy up and I don't care how depressed we say some neighborhoods are. Many people want betterment, but it's always boiled down to people saying we got what we wanted, but we lost what we had because they had community. In Robertson, people were poor, but didn't have enough money to bury. They collected money in the neighborhood to bury. You don't get that where you move now. You don't, you're out there by yourself and you hope someone will feel sorry for you. Next. Now this church here, Mount Olive Baptist Church in Ferguson, this one small area was given to former slaves by the slave, the slave master, slave owner, Thomas January. When they were free, he gave them this land to live on. And when Mike Brown passed away, there's only one family still living there. Everything else was gone. But they had been there since the end of slavery and they built this church. In fact, Kenlock Baptist Church grew out of this church. It's gone too. Now, most of Kenlock's gone. But this little church in Ferguson, if you go there now, you won't see it. 
it disappeared in the 80s, 70s, and 70s. Okay, next. Creed Corps Baptist, First Baptist Church of Creed Corps. The black community around the church is long gone. A, a landowner gave them a church, gave them the land for the church. They built the church, and many people who moved out to Creed Corps now, many African Americans, now attend church there. And so they, uh, most of the African American community is gone that lived around there, the original families have disappeared because of industry and being bought out. Next slide. This is a school they went to, a one room schoolhouse. Uh, you, when 54 came, 1954, they said you had to desegregate the schools. The county superintendent, I spoke with him, uh, Mr. Bosbrink, he went out in Parkway. They were part of Parkway. Parkway is made up now of many little school districts. So when he came, went out to visit the school, the, the, those who operate the school, he said, it's time to get rid of the one-room school. And so because of his pressure, the Parkway School District closed it down. So that's what it looked like after some years. It got into decay, but it Looked a little better than that when the kids were born there, I assure you. But it's a family that lives there now, was living there before they tore it down. You can see the sled and a lot of junk in the front, uh, part of the front of the house. Okay, let's hit the next one. Now, it's a, uh, Rock Spring community, when this school was built, was not part of St. Louis. It's near Sarah and Boyle Avenue. And where it's located, was located, the next school we're going to see is, uh, they built it and not people moved there, they built another school. Let's look at the next school. They built this school. It named it Phyllis Wheatley, it was first called Colored school number seven. You know, schools had numbers rather than names. And the reason when St. it was under the St. Louis Board of Education, but they wanted to name it after whites and black parents objected to that. So they named that the principals named, named the school. And this was Wheatley. Now let's look at the next school. Enough African Americans moved in the area, they built this school. And if you could see the other, they put a second story to it. At first, it was just one story, they built another story on. Then the highway came and took the community out. At 4200 block of Papan, if you look at the highway, it's under the highway, 4200 block of Papan. So a neighborhood that was growing. We tell that by the schools, little big building, one story, two story, then vanish. It's not too far from um, Ikea, but it's back over in that area there. So, but that's what happens. Neighborhoods grow, space is needed. You can, sometimes if it was a rich neighborhood, they would have routed the um, highway a little differently, but it was a poor community with not a lot of uh, power, so they took the took the community out. Okay, Fifth Baptist Church. The community had the church, little convenience store, and so you can see that. Now the church caught on fire, but they've rebuilt a couple of times. Now they're on Natural Bridge near Grand Avenue in an old Masonic building, not too across from old Fa Fairground Park, but it's grown. But that's a picture of the church. And it's gone too because of the highway. The, the lots so the whole, you can't even see any 
trace of the old neighborhood because of the highway took it out. Okay, let's look at the next little picture. Now, <clears throat> this is First Baptist Church of Valley Park. It's gone. Uh, the cemetery is pretty much out. It celebrated its 104th birthday and late to mid 1990s. But each, the black community lived near the river. And so every time they had a flood, they lost membership. The church once served as a school too, also. But because it was located in the flood area, it kept losing members. So eventually it just died away. And I have no, I have not found a trace of it. I can't, I looked in the, over the internet, looked in phone books, I don't think they rebuilt. I think it's just disappeared. It first was made up of early members from Fenton, Missouri. Some of them came into Valley Park to the church. Okay, let's move on here. Now we're gonna look at the Veal area. These are all neighborhoods that started in the 1800s. The Veal started around 1880. Blacks began to move there. That was a section Whites were too interested. Some of the high schools built in 1910, but El uh, Simmons Elementary School came around 1885. So we know that African Americans used to live there. It's about one square mile. It had a hospital, which we're going to see, law school, beauty cultural school. Half the doctors in the country tra trained it. Homer G. Phillips, let's look at that. Almost didn't get it. Uh, Homer G. Phillips' attorney worked to get the bond issue to build the hospital, but the city wanted it tagged on to the White Hospital. If you notice, that's quite a complex. You have the nursing school in the back, and so you have a laundry, morgue, different wings. The hospital was set up with wards. You didn't have rooms, you had wards. And when they took care of patients, they put a rolling a screen around each patient to work with them. Well, half the doctors in the country were, claimed it, were trained in Homer G. Phillips. So you had the hospital there, which was a major attraction for a lot of people to come. You had people who lived in the neighborhood, worked in the neighborhood, and so you had a mixture of incomes. Money stayed several times in the neighborhood before it left, which made the community grow. A lot of your uh, prominent people lived in the community, and we have some that had the largest, I'm told, a few years ago, the most distinguished alumni association of any school, black or white. Now you have to consider the fact that for years, Sumner was the only high school for African-Americans in the area. And when you have a large population concentrated in one place, you're gonna have more than you have. Whites had many options, black folks didn't. And so that's why you have. Some people know the school by Tina Turner, Chuck Berry, and uh, John, John James Milton Turner lived in the area. So we had a lot of prominent people that attend school in the area here. Let's hit the next one. Lincoln Law School. This is uh, 1938. This is a key case. Uh, Lloyd Gaines wanted to go to the University of Missouri Law School. Rather than admit him, they built a, a segregated law school in St. Louis. And many people said it's a Jim Crow school, why would we accept it? But they began to train attorneys in civil rights law. And one of the early graduates was Margaret Bush Wilson, 
who worked with the Shelley versus Kramer case, and she helped her father do that case all the way to the Supreme Court, where they ruled segregated housing illegal. But it came out of that Lincoln Law School there. So we need to be familiar with that. Next. One of the areas that most people don't talk about is these handicapped school, Turner School for Handicapped Youngsters, the first of its kind in the country, where you had handicapped ramps and everything. It's, uh, Charles Turner was an etymologist, a world-renowned etymologist who taught at Sumner High School. Uh, Sumner High School had many individuals who uh, had their doctorates. And I would say, I went to Sumner, and I say we did well because many of the others couldn't. And I say that because many of those individuals with their doctor's degree and this high level of training couldn't get jobs in other places. White institutions wouldn't hire them. So we got some of the best and most knowledgeable people in the, in the country. Uh, I think that's worth noting. Also, came up at a time when women were not allowed to marry. So the students became their family. So he had those two things. We profited because others couldn't. I think we have to keep that in mind. We had more extracurricular activities and more things offered to us than many whites had in their schools. And we had more uh, offerings and more trained staff than no, most white schools had, even those illustrious white schools. Next. Next. Now, this is how the neighborhood looks now. The house school closed, closed in 1979 with the police there and everyone else. The neighborhood's gone. Less than a square mile, stable neighborhood, money circulating, businesses. Next shot here. This is how the streets look. What happened to them? They're gone. The city had a policy in the 60s, Team 4 put out called benign neglect. You don't enforce the codes. Uh, where I live in Bill area, there are a number of us lived in Lincoln Court Apartments, two room cold water flat. Many families had five kids in two rooms. So when, after the Shelley versus Kramer decision, they moved, they were able to move out. And so gradually, because of the value of the homes, people gave up and left. Slum lords took them, they wore them out, used them up, and left them and they decayed. And that's what we have here. And they've come along and tore them up, banking the land and waiting to redevelop and and those who live there will not be able to afford to come back. Next. We're going out to the county now. Another community developed around the early 1900s. A white developer named Meacham, not John Barry Meacham, but Meacham, he uh, sold lots very cheaply. An early part of the community was uh, Whites, whites, it was mixed. Then more and more African Americans moved into the community. And there were no codes or things you had to standards for building and construction. And so the city of Kirkwood talked Meacham Park residents into letting them annex them to their city. So let's have next slide. This is a picture of some of the homes, some of the better homes in Meacham Park. So it was a rural area. So they made promises and the promises made promises not kept. Let's look at what they built. These are the new places they built. Now everybody said, yeah, I would love to live here. I mean, that's that's some 
they ought to be proud we took all these homes out and put some different homes in there. There was a gentleman named uh, Cookie Thornton. Uh, you may not remember him, but he made the news not too long ago where he went in and shot up the mayor, a number of council members. He had a truck. He made his living with that truck. He bought a new truck and he parked it by his house. And so you can't do that here now. But I don't have to, I can't pay for putting my truck someplace else. But you can't do that here. You, you, you don't understand. We don't allow trucks to be parked in front of homes. They kept finding. He lost his home, lost his wife, I'm told. And he got went to court, lost. And so the city paid for it. He went in one day, one evening, council meeting, and killed some folks. There's some other hard feelings that went on. Many uh, residents felt the people in Kirkwood didn't respect them. They looked down on them. And so there were a lot of hard feelings. So the community had to go through some soul searching after the shooting. And so they're still living with that. And it's a story we need to be mindful of. To many people, the land was given to development. You find commerce all along Lindbergh. Sam's is in there. Lowe's is in there. Uh, a lot of businesses have come to that. Kirkwood wanted because they wanted to redevelop and let, take the land and put make it commercial and bring some revenue to the city. But they took out a community that was close knit. They were bonded to each other and looked after each other. But they lost that with all this new development. So it tells us we have to work with people, work with communities, and make sure there's an understanding of what we're going to say we're going to do when we take over property. Next, this is the shopping area they put in. That's it. Now, on the hill in St. Louis, black people lived on the hill, you know, people. And they brag and say, you know, we got along well. This is a Patterson Avenue Baptist Church. Now, those in St. Louis, if you go into Bolivar, you'll see a building. I think they've given up the church now. But Patterson Avenue moved. The highway took the church out. And so as a result of that, the black community was removed. Now, they began to leave. They used to work in the industry on the hill. They worked in the clay mines. There are pictures of blacks and whites working together in the clay mines on the hill. So they built this church and worshiped there till the highway came and took it out. And so that's, that's where we are. So we're gonna see the school they went to. Next. This the school they went to is still there. And according to the priest I had lunch with, he said in the kitchen there's still the, the blackboard. I don't know if it's still there. This was some 20 years ago. He told me the blackboard was still in the kitchen. They, the boys went in one door, the girls went in another door. He said that's the way it was. But he took pride in saying our black community got along very well with the white community. And I've never heard anyone talk about animosity. The highway and the loss of jobs made the big change in the community. Okay, next one. Now, we're down in South St. Louis. This is Delaney Elementary School. Look how, keep an eye on how it looks. Crondolette at one time was not a part of St. Louis. Uh, they had their own city seal and everything. You'll find the Hispanic community was there, the German community was there. It had a hodgepodge of individuals and they got along well together. Uh, James Milton Turner 
father used to be a a veterinarian in the area. But this was the first school, the Delaney School. Now let's check the next slide. You notice the largest school. Windows the same place on the side and in the front. But the community kept growing. It kept growing because of the industry and the climate there. And let's look at the next slide. It grew till they built him a new school. Then all of a sudden in the 30s, the businesses began to close and people began to move out. And they gave the school to the white community. And if you look at the corner, it's apartment complex now. It's apartments. But if you look at the cornerstone, it says Delaney. When it was given to whites, it became uh, Maddox School. But the cornerstone says Delaney School. But that's school. It was a nice looking building. The Crondelet, you didn't have the racial issues that they had in the rest of the city. But that goes back uh, years ago before the Civil War. Okay, next slide here. Now, our beloved community, Clayton, Missouri. If you read Clayton history books, you don't know they had black people there. This was Clayton Baptist Church, used to be on Brentwood Boulevard. And that's where it stayed. That whole block of Bonhomme had blacks in there. One of the board members, Ferguson Florison, that she used to live where the Sheridan Hotel is. I was on the radio once, and a woman called and said where um, the Ritz Carlton is. One of the teachers' family had a farm there. Some some of the high school teachers, Miss Clayta Williams, her family had a farm there. She remembered that. So it was okay years ago. Then it became a place where we need to build some business. Next slide. This is the school the kids went to until 1954. And then they integrated. Give me the next one. That replaced the black community. Throughout Clayton, many of the small homes of white communities, whites lived in, are gone. High rise, easy to buy them out, multi million dollar corporations take, have taken over. But your trace of the black community is completely gone. You don't even find it in their history books. And I think we need to, now there was a teacher at the high school. Uh, she worked with students and where the school was, that the second building from the corner where the parking lot is, there's a plaque, a bronze plaque there in, in the grass. She had it put there in recognition of the black community that used to be there in the school that was there. And there's some coins that were made Attics Elementary School. It was named for Christmas Attics. So that's where we are. That's what's happening to many of our communities. Next slide, please. Up on the, I guess you'd say, the northern edge outside the city, uh, close to the Riverview Garden School District, there's a place called Prospect Hill. The school had programs, graduation programs, at Prospect Hill. It was next to the cement plant. And families worked at the cement plant and they lived in the community. And that was a one room school with a uh, play area in the basement and cafeteria, but that was it. It stayed till 54. The NAACP came up there, Morris Henderson, president of NAACP, came up there and told the folks, why don't you consider closing this? 
his time's over for a one-room schoolhouse. So he talked him into closing the school. And that's what happened. The community, the, finally, the cement plant closed and the church school closed. And then next, the church that was there, it closed. Church was gone when a lady had a, uh, what do you call, souvenir plaque plate made, and she gave me a picture from the plate. That's from a plate, kind of know the edges around there. That's inside the plate. So it's Pottsville Hill Baptist Church. If you go down Highway 70, you look on your, if you're going east, you look on your left-hand side, you could see the church from the road. Pottsville, Prospect Hill Baptist Church. They moved away. Everyone was gone. They moved to the city. And that's where you find the church, but it was the plant closing that I think put a final nail in the, in the coffin of the church in that area, but it's still thriving in the city of St. Louis. Nice building, brick building. Next. Now we have Robinson, Missouri. Rural area had a white school and a black school. And in 54, blacks took over the school board. Enough African Americans took over the school board. Whites tried to want two schools, but they built one school. It had a good tax base for industry. And I've seen papers with Ferguson Forreston School District in 1954 wanted to take over all of Hazelwood because Hazelwood didn't have a high school at that time. All the way around past Kenlock and Berkeley and take in Scudder, the black school district there because of their tax base. Not because they wanted to integrate, but they wanted the money that that place could bring when uh, they didn't have enough students to have a high school. So they met with the school district of Berkeley to take their students. And Berkeley was ready to take them because they had money in the, they had money in the bank, a brand new building. And so they, they went with the Berkeley school district. But their other districts wanted because of the tax in district. They're now part that community, which is now under the highway, is part of the um, Hazelwood community. Next. Some of the students. I thought I'd put this picture of the kids in there. They had a band. You know, they aren't deprived, as people said. They, they, it wasn't a rich area. But it was an area where parents took great pride in their schools in the community with little money they had. Next picture. Now, why you see this? When whites moved into Hazelwood, because you have to remember, in the 60s, most of Hazelwood and Florence were fields. No homes. They contracted with the Robinson Fire Protection District for fire protection services. So the Robinson Fire Protection District you see now came out of the black community of Robinson. And many people don't realize they provided the fire protection for the people of Fire Robinson. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, this is the one that we talk about. It's in Brentwood, where the Brentwood Promenade is. Those were nice homes. There was a school there. School had been closed when the Promenade came. Had churches, schools, baseball team, little convenience store. Because of when they, everyone in the early days used to work at a brick plant. That's where the Howard and Evans brick plant. Uh, 
They went all the way up to Hanley Road, I'm told. Up to Brentwood, rather. Brentwood to Hanley. There were a lot of uh, homes there. Black families lived there because they worked at the Blick plant. And whites were not interested in that area at that time. Business were not interested in that. Only when businesses said, we want this, did they begin to buy the black families out. So let's get the next one. So the families were bought out and this replaced it. I had a classmate who lived on one of those streets and a fraternity brother who got a new home out of all of this. But it was a close knit community. It was because of segregation, money circulated many times, several times before it left. You know, your beauty shop was there, your barber shop was there, convenience store was there, church was there. So money circulated and then it left. And that's because once you go out to the white community and many of the neighborhoods that are there now, no business, no industries, money never stays. It never stays. So the communities now make their money off the track of the tickets because there's no business and trying to support the community. When it was all African-American, money stayed because the business was there because whites at the time didn't want black money and, they, and so they wouldn't, didn't have stores, they didn't have funeral parlors, and all those things stayed, that money stayed in the African-American community. Okay, let's see where we are. Now, in honor of the community, they placed a rock at the back of the mall. And you can sit and meditate when the weeds are. They try, I think, to be honest, they try to keep the weeds down, but they for damn sure didn't want to, want to know the rock was there because you have to drive all the way to the back of the mall to see it. And if you, the fence is there, so it's on the road. If you're on the road path, you, you won't see it. If you, you have to drive slow to see it. It tells what it's in honor of. And they had to, the community had to fight to get that there. Because there was no interest in saying about the community what it used to be there. So that's, if you didn't know the rock was there, you would have no idea there was used to be an African-American community there. So it's gone. Business is there, but the community is gone. Okay, let's see the next one. Now, this is Ken city of Kenlock. It's gone because of airport expansion, the industrial park. These are some of the businesses that used to be in Kenlock. They had a high school. Now, Kenlock and Berkeley, you know, Berkeley was Kenlock at one time. Many people don't realize that. Berkeley was a white part of Kenlock. When they could not control the schools, they incorporated the community of Berkeley. And they took the money with them. So, but when Kenlock was, it was segregated self-contained for the most part, but no large tax base. But money circulated many times before it left. I remember t speaking with a woman who was in her late 30s. She had never been out of Kenlock. Everything she wanted was in Kenlock. So I don't go. Shop, bought her clothes, went to the doctor, dentist, all in Kenlock. Let's, next, that's the early police department, that's City Hall, they're the first elected black mayor in Missouri, first elected black board of aldermen, the first black 
school super first black six black first six black superintendents in the state of Missouri. Uh, they believe they had the first junior high school named for President Kennedy. They were meeting the night to talk about building the junior high the night President Kennedy was shot. And they think they have the first one in the country. They have the first Catholic retreat center in the world for African Americans was in Kenlock, Manorisa. They have a cave chapel in the uh, community. But all that's fading because of the airport. The airport took out a large portion, almost all of Kenlock. If you go where a nice subdivision was, you see a large storage facility for one of the industries. Next. The volunteer fire department. It's interesting. When they took over the city, the fire department was not very had a bond issue passed. So they have a fire district. And so the men would come to the fire station and be there every day. They wouldn't leave, they wouldn't give it up. So they're gonna to have to build another fire station with a fire truck because there's no one to, not enough people there to abolish it. And the people who there wanted to stay. And so they don't need it. They said, we don't need it. We got Ferguson Fire Department, got the Berkeley. But this district is there and the people work on it. They're there every day to sit there. No money. Sometimes they don't have money for the gas for the uh, fire trucks because the business industry has taken all the business away. So there it is. But they have a new building, but I just wanted to see the fire the men who were there. Well-dressed, nice people. Next. Had a nice library. And uh, that was a county library, but it was a public library. Kids would come to there, study after school, and do their homework. And so it's a nice, nice building, nice place for kids. Public library. So I just wanted to see some of the things that Kellogg had. Next, had a movie theater, Lincoln Movie Theater. So Kellogg, in spite of being poor, I think uh, one of the things that happened with Kellogg, and I've been told that you have to watch gift houses in the mouth when they gave him the tour homes down and gave him the projects. Kenlock was an old community of generations of people who stayed and people didn't leave Kenlock. And so you, and you put hundreds of people who have no uh, respect for the culture there and so you have an element where everyone first knew everyone in there, they knew their parents. Then you get a group of people who are new, don't care about all those niceties and knowing people. And it kind of brings the morale down. But the closing of the schools and the constant buying out of homes for the airport expansion killed Kenlock by a thousand cuts a little at a time. So basically that there's nothing hardly there now. They had a post office. The postmaster told me once, he had a hard time getting a truck to take deliver mail. You know, square a mile. They they thought black folks didn't get mail, so they had to walk to deliver mail until they finally gave it something to deliver the mail in. So they had a post office. So it, it was a Little community. Two elementary schools, junior high and high school. Struggling, small tax base, but struggling. 
as one guy said, we got nice homes. We moved in another area. We got out, able to go out. And to go into the Ferguson, they had chains across the road to the 60s. They didn't want black folks in the Ferguson. Ferguson was a sundown town. So you had to be out of Ferguson before the sun went down. So it's open up now. Got the freedom, but they lost the community they had where everyone knew each other and cared for each other. Next. Okay. Ready for questions. That's Thank all. you. Thank you. That was really a wealth of information. What we didn't do all, you know, there are a number of communities uh, we didn't do. I think we need to worry about some communities. Bennett Place in um, Richmond Heights, they wanted to put a the metro through Bennett Place. And they said, they had a meeting, they said, well, you know, they got these nice big homes, which were white. We don't want to disturb them. And they felt all of a sudden we're going to get in a lawsuit. So they began to get some alternatives for that. We got North Webster, nice community. I've even seen white families begin to move in one day. I was up there. Uh, but they wanted to take out small homes in Webster for area, for uh, shopping district. Um, one I think that we really need to worry about is Westland Acres in Chesterfield. The West family bought 100 acres right after slavery ended. It belonged to the family. Small, modest homes are there. The land around there with these almost near million dollar homes has made the land very valuable. And these people with these small homes pay a heavy tax rate. They're retired, they're old, and so the community doesn't want to give them a break. They could grandfather those people as long as the family is there and change once they leave. But it, there, we need to worry about it because there's a strong desire to take that community out. So we need to worry about that um, and look after those communities. I think any place where there are small homes um, and next to places that need money, we can lose them. Uh, some homes have disappeared. There's one community which we didn't get to. The Patch. Have, have any of you heard, have you heard about Pat Gwen? Yeah. It was behind Peebley Dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's disappeared. You don't find any of the books, any papers. And if you didn't know people who once lived there, it's just gone. Yeah. And so we, we have a home place up in Blackjack, Missouri. <laughs> people live there, it's gone. So we just have to be careful. We lose our communities. We don't know they were there. We don't know how we lost them. But we just have to be careful. Well, Dr. Dr. Wright, I'm, that was so much information. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get right to the questions. I have some myself, but I'm, I'm going to yield to okay. our viewers. The, the, this first question is from uh, uh, Dr. Torres, and she's asking about uh, Dr. Edward Alexander Boucher. I suppose that's the way you pronounce his name. The first African-American to earn a PhD at Yale. He taught at Sumner High School. And she wants to know, do, do you know for how many years he was there? He wasn't there that long, but um, he taught when he was downtown. He eventually went back home and died in, in his hometown. He never got married. Um, but I'm not quite sure how many years he taught there, but it wasn't a long period of time. Do you know when that was that he taught there? He taught before the World's Fair. Oh, OK. Is when it was downtown before they moved out on in the Ville area. This is a question about Mill Creek. 
I understand there was a large African-American community called Mill Creek near St. Louis University. I'd like to hear Dr. Wright explain what happened there to drive out that community. Well, it was, it was urban removal, urban mm -hmm. renewal. Uh, churches, it was all the way down to uh, Banner Venter. I mean, uh, you had homes there, Compton. All that used to be African American. We had a strip of families. You had many of our cultural institutions there uh, the YMCA, the churches, the schools, uh, all were there. And nightclubs. We bought homes when whites left them. We bought them. You know, we had the real estate agencies would only let African Americans live in certain neighborhoods. In communities, and they, they deteriorated. We didn't have uh, support to get them funding to get them taken care of, and so we had the '60s. Those buildings was torn were torn down, and they moved to west, west, uh, west part of the city, and now you know then they made slum property out of those. They uh, charged double money for them. They uh, made room in houses. And so they came back to renew those and remove people from those. And so it's just a progressive thing. I tell people racism is business. You got to scare enough white folks so you can make money. You know, if you don't scare enough white folks, money dries up. So you build subdivision and you tell them you got bikes. If you keep them miserable, they'll always want to move and you have white folks afraid, they'll always want to move. And so white folks have a theory that 25% can consume 75. So no matter where they move, how many rooms and houses in the subdivision, black folks are going to take the whole subdivision over. And they believe that. And so they keep moving every time they build a new subdivision. Uh, University City killed that myth. They put their own housing rental service and home development when white realtors wouldn't show them the white families they had an office where they showed homes to white families and that big mansion on Del Mar I'm told went for 25,000 to post rent but it's no different from those off of uh, Union Avenue those homes were going for 35,000 uh, some went for 15, 16, they wouldn't give loans. Families bought them now, you pay almost a million dollars to get into them. But it's the fear factor gets into it. But they had bled the downtown area enough. It was time to bleed some other areas because other areas opened up for whites. And so you could let them go. Well, uh, Dr. Wright, when I mentioned my family was from one of those disappearing black communities, it was Mill Creek. So I'm glad you did talk about it. <laughs> okay. I used to go to YMCA. I used to go to YWCA, YMCA down there. Pine Street Y. You know, I saw you on Living St. Louis where you were talking about the, the Pine Street YMCA. Yes. We used to go down to Pine Street Y. The building that used to be on Market and Jefferson, the uh, People's Finance Building. Mm -hmm. It was built by Blacks, but you know, we could not get jobs doing the construction of that building. We couldn't get jobs with the uh, building of Poor Oak College. Uh, couldn't get jobs building the Homer G. Phillips Hospital. The people walked off when they had a tile setter. Uh, and we had a whole list of people who were qualified. We had union membership. They said, couldn't be any member. One company said, we're going to send our people off and let them get trained. And they said, if you do, they'll never come back to do the work here in St. Louis. So all those things. Yeah. Well, doc, Dr. Wright, this is, this is a question from Amy Whiteman. I'm hoping, hoping I'm not mispronouncing your name. But she talks about there was a black school that was in the Rockwood School District. Uh, do you know anything about that school? Uh, there were black school. It was a black school in Rockwood. Mm -hmm. It was in Western Acres. Uh, it was one room that moved 
at the bottom of the hill. Then it moved to a, a larger facility. It became a HDC office. But those kids lived there, but many of them didn't go to high school till 50, after 54. The community would not pay their tuition, provide transportation. They paid tuition, but they wouldn't give them transportation. And so many of them were deprived of a high school education until after 54, unless they had ways to get to the city of St. Louis or Douglas High School to get an education. But there's a school there. And parents and the NAACP had to fight to get the school district to open that, start letting kids out of that little small building into the other schools in the community. This Brianna Greenwood, she has a question. She wants to know are there any black communities still in place and thriving that have existed since the late 19th and early 20th century? I know Ferguson would be one, that's what she says. Well, I don't know if it's thriving. When you're hustling all your money off of tickets, traffic tickets, you aren't, you aren't thriving too well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happened, they've dropped the prices. People are running so. You got, Ferguson's in a unique community. You have part of the community, it's something like you would say three communities, you might say. You have the small homes next to the Kinlock community. Then you have the big homes where the folks used to work, come back and forth from the city and live in the, on the railroad barons. You go up down St. Elizabeth. That part of town knows very little about the other part of the city. And it's mostly all white, those big homes over there. So the old homes are mostly white, the small ones are uh, uh, mixed and black. So you got a whole mixture of things there. And so it's thriving to a certain extent. You have some people still holding on. When we got ready to build the school, new school next to the park, uh, what do we name the school? Yeah, people want to name it January Wabash. January was a slave owner. That's where the school had been built on a slave owner's property. When they tore the house down, the chains were still in the basement where you used chain the slaves. That was brought out. So they said, well, we can't name it January. They said, name it J uh, Johnson, the first black school board member in the state. Well, we can name it, but you got to put Wabash on it. Can't name it without Wabash. So that became Johnson Wabash. Wouldn't give it up just Johnson, but they had to put Wabash on it. Then it became Berkeley High School. When they tore down Berkeley High School, they gave money to build another high school. Ferguson folks didn't want the name of Berkeley in their community. And so they insisted to be named. They argued and argued. And Berkeley folks said, you got to put Berkeley somewhere. So the name of the school ended up being uh, uh, Berkeley South, uh, McClure South Berkeley. That's the name of the new high school. So some people said, we don't need a new high school. Well, if you don't get a new high school, we have more black students than McClure. Okay, we better get a high school then. Because uh, the whites in the southern part of Ferguson, southern part of Ferguson, didn't want to go to school with all those black kids from Berkeley. So we still got some things, problems to deal with. Dr. Wright, you mentioned um, a black a community in Creve Corps. How long was that community there? And I, I was thinking about that because of, you know, the, the Creve Corps trying to come to terms with the way they treated Dr. Venable. Uh, could, could you talk about that? It was scattered. I remember seeing little bits and pieces because you remember, it used to be wilderness out there almost. So we have bits and pieces and we came together. But that that was before it became the place to escape to. Venable came when they were building out there, when they were black were there, when they didn't care about who was out there. Mm -hmm. And they began to build more and more homes. I remember an old shack 
when I used to do recreation work in the 60s, old shack with smoke coming out of black family, lived on Olive. That got taken out uh, when business came in. We saw where Baldwin moved, first church, uh, Chess, uh, Chesterfield moved. All these churches moved out when industry came. We most of the homes we had at that time were small homes, and so it's just to give you a good insight for where people live. They, they hear the books. I was on the county board of education when I worked on my dissertation, and on the county board, they had a list of all the black students where tuition was paid for them to go into the city of St. Louis and the Webster. Mm -hmm. And you can see where all of them live in the communities where they live because they paid their tuition for them. So we were scattered out, not just clusters, you know, large communities. But we're enough to have a school that came all over and to uh, come to school. This is a question about Kenlock. You said you talked about Kenlock. And he wants to know the name of the black Catholic church and school that was located in that area. I heard that they were a very active and involved church. Well, uh, Holy Angels was the name of the church. Uh, they were active. It was the oldest Catholic church, I think in the Archdiocese, the longest operating Catholic church, black Catholic church in the Archdiocese. Um, they moved because, you know, the town was drying up. They had the retreat center, uh, the first in the world for black Catholics. And, uh, that was a, in itself, I think they had their own school. I served on their board for about five years, the school board. Many people, professionals, sent their kids to the I laid at Angel School, Catholic school there. So it was a very active church. This is kind of a follow up. Um, they want to know that they noticed that you did show a lot of church buildings in your presentation. And he wants to know more about these buildings. And he wants you to talk about how these churches were the bedrocks of the communities. Well, the churches gave me an idea when they would grow. If you have a small building, then they get bought out and you buy another. It, help, it helps you to change, uh, trace the population. Uh, some churches stayed, and then you wonder about uh, how they went from to another place, like First Baptist Church in Kenlock, during the Depression, they were the bedrock for food and everything else. It's a social place. The churches, when you're in a segregated community, a segregated town, the churches are where you have all your entertainment, all you, where you gather. Uh, it's a place where you come together. You can't, some churches had movies. Uh, Robinson had the firehouse where they showed movies on to kids, and popcorn and soda and stuff. And some of the you didn't have that, you had it at the church. They'd run a film and show it to the kids and uh, it was a thing what you did all day Sunday. Sunday, you have to be in a black community to know what Sunday's like. You have church in the morning, church in the afternoon, and prayer meeting at night. And you spend your whole day at the church. Uh, and so you got a chance to see everyone. And people like the conventions and conferences. And so it was, the experience. Dr. Wright, you, you did talk about Meacham Park quite a bit, but this is a question from the Organization of Black Struggle. And they want you to talk about more about what happened to Meacham Park. Meacham Park, they signed up with Kirkwood in the 90s to merge with, to merge. It was promised that certain things would happen. And as a result, they tore down those homes and built those new homes. 
And as a result of that, the community was destroyed. Uh, the things that used to happen, like uh, with Cookie Thornton, he uh, had a business, but he couldn't have his truck at the place. He had to find another place to park it. And he lost his livelihood. He lost his uh, home. He lost his money. And so as a result of that, he went berserk and killed some folks. Uh, but that sort of says to us, we have to work with the community. What we think is good may be good for us, but it's not necessarily good. Like community, we have to put some things in it. Maybe a community center would have been. What are the liabilities if we change this? What are the things we need to work on, work with people on, so that uh, we are building in a bad feeling? But there's a, another thing too, besides the the relationship between blacks and whites. Uh, Meacham Park, being a poor community, Kirkwood being a wealthy community, they felt the people, the police didn't respect the residents. There was one young man who uh, saw a family member or someone uh, get pushed down and pushed around. He wanted, the mother wanted to see something with the kid and uh, he died. And that's where a police officer was killed because the young man was angry about the look on the police officer's face when he was doing this. And the people felt that this were respected. They didn't care about them. It's the same way we're dealing with now, the police and the community relations. So there was a poor community relations. Uh, you have some individuals, when you're poor, you take a beat no matter where you are. You know, people have an attitude about poor people. And they don't belong here. We're doing, we helping them out and don't respect them. And so people pick that up. People pick that up. Just like dogs can tell you when you're scared, they chase you. Uh, people, kids can tell right away your attitude. In school, black kids can tell when white teachers don't like them or teachers, period, don't like them. They can pick it up the way they ask, give, answer questions, ask them questions, look at them. All those things come through and that's the way it was at Meacham Park they could tell they were not liked and not welcome. And those attitudes have festered for a number of years, even before they merged. But the community is going through soul searching now, mm -hmm. trying to figure out, heal the wounds that have been there. Mm -hmm. Because that shooting brought out a lot of uh, things in that community. Yeah. Well, Dr. Wright, this is one anonymous attendee. He, he, note, he, he notes, or she notes, that when you talked about churches, you talked about those cemeteries that were often attached to churches. And this person wants to know what happened to those cemeteries. Uh, well, some of them are still there. First Baptist of Chesterfield is a nice cemetery, nice fence around it. Um, the Baldwin Cemetery is still there. People don't use them anymore. Some of most of them don't. The one that was in um, Bridgeton, the bodies were moved. The county has a uh, rule that before you can take a body up, you have to get permission to take it. If you, you can't disturb the cemetery and bodies are moved uh, with the approval of those. Now, some cemeteries, I would say, some of these rural cemeteries, they don't know where they are, the, the owners are, they've long vanished, and who do you contact? And they have to work that out with the county. This is a, a, a question for a, an anonymous attendee, and he, he, he notes that a lot of those communities, they disappear because of a, a highway. And he wants to know about the how this, this land was obtained. Uh, eminent domain? Eminent domain, you know, we built a highway, highway coming through. <laughs> you, you know, we don't ask, we just take it. 
you know, now the government uh, in the 40s, they gave money to cities to build highways. And many of those were to take out black communities. They said, we can give you, give it a blight and we'll pay so much, but you always pay that much and we'll pay most of the bill. We will give, and there's an article in the Atlantic magazine that came out in around 92. It talks about highways and poverty. Where highways were given, money for highways were given to cities and they used that to take out black communities. Okay. Intentionally. Intentionally. Intentionally, yeah. Well, I think, I think this is a thoughtful question. What do you think were the effects of these disappearing Black communities? And I think you touched on that. What I should think, we learn? What should we learn that translates today? I think you need to appreciate what you have first. I hear more people in, uh, who used to be in all Black communities Robertson community, they used to have get togethers every year, picnics and things come together to reminisce about growing up together in the community they had. Uh, the Hill has a picnic every year, the residents of the Hill out in Forest Park. For, yes, Forest Park. They come together to talk about the good old days. Um, you have uh, Kenlock, every two years. People come from all the country to come together in Kenlock and celebrate what they used to have. The Ville where I grew up, they used to have a group called F and Avenue and Friends. All my friends have died, so we don't know to get together because the kids don't have the same meaning for it. But people remember the days when we all looked out for each other. We lost that community. People long for the community uh, where well, you knew everyone. And when I'm at my high school reunion, we talk about the things we used to, we grew up with. And, they, and those things are gone, they disappear. Uh, the shows we had, the, uh, the restaurants, the pool hall the policy numbers, the gambling that went on, uh, all those things, the dances we had, you know, at that time uh, it was, I got tickets, we, 50 cents, you can go to a nice place. Then we got integrated, then you paid $50, $25. The $10 tickets disappeared, you know, we, everything was segregated, so black activities were in their neighborhood and in your organizations. And you got to know everyone all over town. And people say, where'd you go to school? Well, you knew five other people that knew that person too. You can't do that now. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. The whites, was a, what parish you would belong to, you were a poor parish, you were one of the poor ones over there. But black folks, it was uh, what neighborhood, your friends, your connections, your clubs, and those clubs were the social for the community because we all went to the same thing. You know, you're going to see your friends. So we got what we wanted. We got better neighborhoods. When we had the Ferguson Florida merger, achievement went down rather than up. So I, I think people need to know that. We, didn't, we got better looking schools at first. And so we stopped doing reports. Now, there's a period of time when the district stopped doing achievement reports by race because achievement when that came out of my office, as I know, there's your report on it. And um, before the merger, I saw one report. A greater percentage of African Americans went to college than Berkeley and Ferguson Florida. State. Greater percentage. I'm not talking about numbers now. I'm talking about percentage because black parents knew that was the only way for them to move ahead. Whites had jobs, industry, other things, but black parents knew 
they, they had to find a better way for their kids by educating them. So percentage-wise, more of us went to college than whites in the one year I looked at. Well, Dr. Wright, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know it just flew by. <laughs> and we, aren't, we can't get to all the other questions that people have for you. Uh, it, it, it really was a, a really insightful and fascinating presentation. Well, I hope so. I hope so. It, right? Oh, absolutely. The photographs were amazing. Uh, so I want to thank you so much um, for giving that young us lady, that young lady information. Out. She drug me in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Shakia now. Shakia got it. <laughs> oh, thank you both so much. Oh, my goodness, Dr. Wright. Thank you for that presentation. It really got to the heart and soul of this series. And I just want to thank you again for answering the call, for saying yes to okay. giving this presentation for us. Um, if our virtual visitors can give Dr. Wright a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure, it's thank a pleasure. So and I'm sorry I was running a little late to get with you. For moderating. Um, yes. You really got to as many questions as you could, and I wish you all could see the number of questions. We have 21 questions, and they keep coming in. So thank you all for your attentiveness and for joining us this evening. Um, for those of you who are new to How Did We Get Here?, Immediately following this series, we have a facilitated 30-minute conversation. It's an uncensored conversation to talk about what we have learned and what we have experienced during this portion of the presentation. That link is now available in the chat. If you would like to join us, please feel free to click that link in the chat box and we will hopefully see you over in the community conversation of this portion. Of Sorry, excuse me, <laughs> for the next portion of this presentation. Also, if you're interested in supporting MHS through a membership, we would be so grateful for your support. Um, please visit our website at mohistory.org and consider supporting us with the membership. Lastly, um, a Kobo toolbox survey may have opened as soon as you open your um, web browser. Please, 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 please. Fill out that survey, let us know what you think about tonight's program, and hopefully you'll, you, you will return and join us next week for the final keynote presentation of this series. But all of these um, presentations will be recorded and they are available on our YouTube website. So please consider joining us again for next week's presentation. We hope that you come back. We hope that you view all of these presentations as many times as you would like. But again, I just want to thank Dr. Wright for joining us and a huge thank you to Gwen Moore for supporting this program this evening. For those of you that will join us in the community conversations, I will be here for about three minutes before I completely shut down this portion of the presentation so you can grab that link and meet us over in the other room. So thank you all for joining us this evening and I will see you momentarily. Have a good evening, everyone. You too. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. When you and I have to get together when we can. Okay.